uh, I want to clarify something from the last video. Uh, I talked about how the screen went black. My laptop, my screen did go black, but when I looked at the video, it didn't go black. It still continued to display what I had on the screen, even though my it must have timed out, so there was no editing necessary. So in case you're wondering what I was talking about, that's what I was talking about, and hopefully, hopefully I won't have that problem in the future. So I want to continue on with this discussion of uh, people being uh, e having equal protection before the law. And in this case, I want to talk about marijuana arrests, arrests for marijuana um, for possession of marijuana. And in order for this to make sense, I have to preface the comments by explaining that in study after study after study that I've seen, there is no difference in the amount of marijuana that black people versus white people use. The rate of uh, marijuana use is similar in both populations. And so if the law is being applied equally to everybody, you would expect that if these two groups are using marijuana at the same level, that the arrests would be comparable as well. And if they aren't comparable, then it raises the question, why? And so that's kind of what we're going to get into. So I want to start off by showing a graph. And on the graph, it shows the years 2010, 2012, 2014, 2016, and 2018. Although this was a while ago, the patterns have continued the same way they are. What this graph shows is that the rate at which black people are arrested for possession of marijuana is substantially higher than the rate at which white people are arrested for the same crime. In fact, in this particular graph, blacks are 3.6 times more likely to be arrested for possession of marijuana than white people. And it's worth considering why that is the case. Some would suggest that black communities are policed more heavily than white communities. And later on, when you, Michelle Alexander talks about her book, The New Jim Crow, she'll discuss some of these ideas. But on its own, while you can't make any final determination about the application of the law, this should at least, I think, raise some suspicions about why it is that if blacks and whites are using marijuana at the same level, why blacks are more likely to be arrested. Now I want to show you another graph. What's displayed on the screen now shows the states, the United States, ranked by the racial disparity in marijuana arrests. Now what, I, what I'm displaying here are the five where the disparity is the least in five states and then where the disparity is the most in five states. So as you can see, in Colorado, for example, which has the lowest disparity between blacks and whites, blacks are still 1.5 times more likely to be arrested. And this is even though marijuana has been legal, was legalized in 2012. In Alaska, blacks are 1.6 times more likely to be arrested. In Hawaii and California, blacks are 1.8 times more likely to be arrested, and in Oregon as well. So there's still this disparity that exists. But if you look at the five rate states where the highest level of disparity exists, in Iowa and Virginia, West Virginia, I'm sorry, blacks are 7.3 times more likely to be arrested. In Illinois, they're 7.5 times more likely to be arrested. In Kentucky, they're 9.4 times more likely to be arrested. And in Montana, they're 9.6 times more likely to be arrested. Once again, I don't think you can say anything determinatively about this, just looking at these numbers. But in my estimation, this is at least cause for suspicion as to why there's such a disparity in every single state, obviously to lesser degrees. 1.5 times more likely in Colorado versus 9.6 times more likely in Montana. 
And it's with that as the backdrop that I want you to li listen to the vid an interview with uh, Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow. Her emphasis is on mass incarceration. And I think what she has to say is interesting, and I'll talk about it on the other end. You're going to be talking about mass incarceration used as a tool for social control. Mm -hmm. How does that tie into the war on drugs? And has the war on drugs, in fact, done more harm than good? Yes, absolutely. It has. The war on drugs has really been the engine of mass incarceration. Within a 30-year period of time, our nation's prison population quintupled, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is extraordinary. Um, the rate of increase in such incredibly short period of time, and much of that increase was driven by the war on drugs. For example, um, between 1985 and 2000, uh, the period of the, our greatest expansion of our prison system, um, more than half of the increase in the state prison population and two-thirds of the increase in the federal prison population was due to drug convictions alone. Mm -hmm. You know, drug convictions have increased more than 1,000 percent since the drug war war began. Um, so this war on drugs really has been the mechanism by which young people, particularly young black and brown men, mm -hmm. um, have been targeted by the police, stopped, frisked, searched, arrested for, you know, typically, you know, minor, nonviolent, mm -hmm. drug-related offenses, swept in to the criminal justice system. And then once you're swept in, you're really trapped for life. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you're lucky enough to get just felony probation, um, you will acquire a criminal record that will follow you for the rest of your life and authorize legal discrimination against you in employment, housing, access to education, yeah. and public benefits. So this war on drugs um, has turned out to be less of a war on a substance uh -huh. <laughs> or set of substances and instead more of a war on a group of people defined largely by race and class and it has served to relegate millions to a permanent second class status not unlike uh, the second class status occupied by African Americans uh, you know in an earlier era. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we as a nation are so concerned with punishing people for possessing marijuana or nonviolent crimes and, and putting them in prison for nonviolent crimes and things that aren't, you know, as, I guess, violent as we, you know, would think of other offenses. Why are we so focused on that in this country? Well, you know, it's interesting because we're not obsessed with punishing all people mm -hmm. for minor nonviolent drug-related offenses. We're focused on punishing some people for those crimes and who does time for these nonviolent mm -hmm. drug offenses are overwhelmingly black and brown even though studies have consistently shown for decades that people of color are no more likely to use or sell illegal drugs mm -hmm. than whites you know poor folks of color have been targeted at grossly disproportionate rates in some states 80 to 90 percent of all drug offenders sent to prison have been African-American. Um, so this punitive impulse hasn't been directed at all drug users. If you're, you know, white and lived in, live in a relatively privileged neighborhood um, and you possess marijuana, um, the odds are extremely small that you're going to be stopped and frisked and searched mm -hmm. by the police. And even if you get caught <laughs> with marijuana, you know, the odds of you actually going to jail or doing prison time for that offense are, you know, slim to none. Um, but for people of color, um, the odds are high. Um, and, you know, what is that punitive impulse mm -hmm. about? Our impulse to punish poor folks of color for these relatively minor crimes that go largely ignored, you know, in other communities. I think that impulse, unfortunately, is linked to our racial history. It's due to racial stereotypes, anxieties, fears, and resentments that linger on um, and that we have not fully overcome, even as we elect our nation's first black president and, you know, all appearances, on the surface at least, you know, suggest that we're moving in the right direction.
Now, Professor Alexander provides a, a lot of thoughtful commentary on this disparity between black arrests and white arrests. And she also talks about the consequences of more black people and not just the fact that they get arrested, more likely to get arrested for what I think a lot of people consider to be small, less important crimes, significant crimes like possession of marijuana, and especially younger people, which I'm sure fits a lot of you, but that the consequences of getting arrested and the consequences of having something on your record can have long lasting uh, implications for somebody. It can affect their ability to go ahead and become productive members of society, even if they've made a mistake or they got busted when they were relatively young. This can be, a, it can have significant consequences. Is that a product, as she suggests, of our past? Is it a product of sort of a, what she refers to as a racial reckoning that needs to, to happen? That's a big question. That's a huge question. And once again, and I, as I've said a number of times, it's something that I think we should consider and talk about if it's something that's interesting to you. What, you, what did you think about what uh, Professor Alexander said? Was she spot on? Does that fit with your experience and has, have, how you understand it? Is this, as I've suggested, suggested, is this a problem for America? This, it, does this indicate that there's a lack of political equality? These are all big issues, important issues. And uh, to the extent that you're interested, let's talk about them. Either on the lecture, dis lecture discussion board for assessing democracy or on the current events discussion board, especially if something is happening currently that bears on this particular topic. In the next video, I'll be talking about political liberty, which is something a little bit different.